Welcome back to another episode of the Rankable Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank, and I am hyped because this is going to be another one of those really fun AI deep dives. Today, I'm being joined by none other than Christian Ward. He's the chief data officer at Yex. This dude has literally written the book on data leverage. I mean, that's the name of the book, Unlocking the Spreads and Growth Potential of Data Partnerships. Check it out. Written about five years ago on Amazon. Him and his brother have made so many data partnership sales, and data really is the name of the game when it comes to AI. So we're going to talk everything AI today. What's percolating in his brain? Christian, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining me. Hey, Garrett, nice to be here. Thank you so much. So first off, I have been seeing you have these conversations with Paul Roser, with your brother, talking about AI, and some of your posts on LinkedIn immediately make my brain explode. So the place I would even want to start is how are you using AI in your day-to-day? Uh, so one of the best ways I would say is probably everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, so literally, I I, I don't... I don't think there's any way not to use it. I, I think realistically, um, I'm trying to leverage it in as many places as I can. And I'm doing that mostly because I'm trying to understand what are the ways it can be applied. Uh, this is not one of those things you can read an article and you can be like, oh, I get it. Yeah, that makes sense. You can't do that. You actually have to use it. And and I think what's kind of magical about it is, is as you use it, it unlocks all these other sort of ways of thinking. Um, for example, I'm a big fan of the, the Feynman technique of learning. Uh, Richard Feynman, the world uh, physicist, just, just absolutely one of the most brilliant minds of all time. And the Feynman technique is if you really want to learn something, choose a topic, explain it to someone else like they're a five-year-old, and then continue from there um, and, and, and sort of refine and improve. And uh, so I was, I was like, I wonder if I could do that on my morning walk because I have a speech to give later on about marketing and AI. So I'm gonna get, I'm, so I, I pull up uh, ChatGPT while I'm walking uh, and I, I tell it, hey, I wanna engage in the Feynman technique. Can I teach you something? And I want you to just listen. And then after that, I want you to fully interrogate the entire thing, check your work, all those things. And it came back with this brilliant analysis of what I, what I taught it very clearly and well versus where I really needed work. And it mirrored what I thought, but I would have to go grab somebody, a human, and say, hey, I need you to go on a walk with me. I, I just... That sort of thing where we're using it, you could use it as a listener, not just as like a an ulterior search engine. I, that's the type of thing where I'm using it as much as possible to see what it's capable of. And then I take it and apply it in my professional life. So I'm really trying to get people to leverage it personally and professionally because the professional is inevitable. It's going to happen. But the personal is something you get ahead of right now, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, to that point, there's something natural about the conversational nature of AI that we're not used to. It's like, you know, you you hear the word voice search, you're like, okay, I can ask Siri, but Siri can't do shit at this point. Like, and obviously Apple's working on that. Yeah. And it speaks to this idea of behavior change. Do you think that like, has, has it gotten more natural for you to use the tool as you do it? Um, so it's, it's more, it's more natural, but, but I think we're thinking about this all wrong. And I, I see people talking about this way. And it, yeah, at this, I'm reaching frustration levels with this, which is you're not adopting this. You're not changing your behavior. In fact, I would argue this is the unshackling of abnormal behavior that we have done for 20 years, which is instead of going on a walk and realizing I need new sneakers and going shoes, Nike, men's near me, size nine, like nobody talks like that. But if I could just be talking naturally of, hey, you know what, later on, I need to go by the mall and I don't want to show me exactly where to park. I want to pick up some new Nikes and, and I just talk. That's not adoption. That's actually freeing us up. So when we talk about adoption, humans adopt things behaviorally with technology for very specific reasons. There's a, there's a theory by Fred Davis from 1989. It was his dissertation doctoral, and it's absolutely famous. It's been revised many, many times since then, but it's called the technology acceptance model. And in academia, this is kind of, this is one of the old OGs you point to in theory and go, okay. And basically what it says, it's based on the theory of planned behavior. And it basically says people adopt technology for two reasons. The first is how useful do they perceive it to be? And the second is how easy is it to use? That's it. Perceived utility over perceived ease of use. But with conversational interfaces, 
the perceived ease of use, like the cognitive burden of learning a new tech is going to zero. You and I have never lived in a world where you could literally, like, for example, are you, how are you at Excel? Are you like- I'm okay, probably... but I use the internet frequently. Okay, but uh, so like, so spreadsheet wise though, you know how to build a spreadsheet and everything else. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, all right. So when, you, when you're in a meeting, typically there are people, like I like to look, I used to be in investment banking. So like Excel was our, you know, that was our religion, right? So I'd look around the room and I'm like, they can Excel, they can Excel. Like, okay, there's certain people you can tell, like that's how they think. But in that, imagine now going and speaking as, a, let's say, a search engine optimization strategist or as a marketer and saying something to the, talking to it and saying, listen, I'd like to build a spreadsheet where you put in all the formulas. But what I'm trying to learn is I want to track based on Google Analytics and then our own dialogue analysis, what, what topics are working. And I don't really care about the fat topics. I'm looking for the long tail. And could you tell me what we're specifically mentioning in those posts that's working? And it starts populating the data, everyone becomes amazing at Excel. So you have to take a step back and go, well, if it used to be how easy it is and how utility it, how utilitous it is, and everything's easy to use, then the only technologies that will actually be adopted in the future are the ones that have the most utility. And that's amazing. And I just, again, I, I, I don't think people quite grasp just yet how big that is. You're not adopting this technology. It used to be, I like to say, it used to be that computer savvy humans had an advantage. Mm -hmm. But now that the computers are human savvy, that advantage is being democratized. Anyone can leverage it. And I think that opens up a world of entrepreneurial and, and sort of business opportunities. Oh, I mean, to that point, you think like the jump from MS-DOS to like a graphical user interface with, with Steve Jobs is like that was removed some friction. What you're talking about, I think the issue right now is there's a novelty of the chat GPTs and the dollies of the world, but it's not good enough yet for a lot yeah. of people. And yeah. like to you and I know we're at like, we're at the the starting point, even though, you know, machine learning has been around for you know, 15, 20 years, we're at a starting point at a mainstream consumer where it's not her, you know, like the movie her with, with yes. fucking Phoenix, where yes. you can just have that, or you can talk to the spreadsheet and feel confident that the results are accurate. Yeah. I mean, until then. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so that's a great point, right? Which is, um, this is the beginnings of it, but um, on a geometric curve, I would say we're no longer here, we're here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that that's the difference between the change of state, something that took 12 years and now is going to take 15 minutes. So I would tell you that I think we're going to be there very fast. In fact, um, everyone probably watched, or if you didn't and you're not as geeky as Garrett and I, there was this thing uh, called the Rabbit uh, Company launched the R1 and it's a device whereby you can speak to it and it gets things done for you. And I'm going to say the keynote was 22 minutes. And I snipped, there's one 60 second part in that where he explains something called the large action model. There's been two other similar announcements by other companies since then. But the large action model is, it is analyzing. The way an LLM is analyzing how we converse, the LAM analyzes how we interact with user interfaces. And what he's saying is, is you could now say to the rabbit, and I don't think it's there yet, but you, the idea here is I could say to it, hey, can you go to Excel? I have a spreadsheet on the, the SEO metrics and I want to graph it, but I want to put it in um, Canva. So then go to Canva and paste that in and then make sure you upload it to my blog. That's a, a Webflow. And, and what it's doing is because it has analyzed how you click on these interfaces to do these things, you walk away for three minutes and it manages the interface. See, that's, that's a really big deal because what he's saying is, is I don't care if you have an iPhone or an, or an Android or Excel or, or uh, Google Sheets. I've analyzed billions of human interactions with the software. So he's abstracting that you don't need APIs to do this. He can actually mimic the human engagement. And so when that happens, what you're saying is, is hey, it doesn't really quite get there. I'm like, yeah, it's getting there. It's going to be very fast. Um, I think Google and I think Apple are going to launch things this year that just blow people's minds. But the adoption on this again is it's not like adopting your first iPhone. It's very hard to explain this, but you have to go back to like Piaget's theories of childhood development. Like we're talking about from the age of zero to two, you're babbling, right? That it's, it's the first stage. That's, that's keyword search. That's literally like, Financial advisor, Redback, New Jersey. 
near me, right? Like that's babbling. That's it's gibberish. But from two to eight, it's a different level. It's actually when children start to have full conversational capability. So that means before we can read and write, you will soon be able to talk with and engage with every technology. That's a big deal. Um, there's two stages after that with AI. I think it's going to get really scary. But I think following childhood development uh, patterns, um, like, again, time-honored sort of, there's, there's problems with every theory. But if you really want to know where this is going, please understand we're merely mimicking our own development. And so this is this is a great way to frame it. That's and that's nuts. And so it's funny because it's like, you know, I come in with some some questions that I think when I ask you're already changing my perspective. Like I was gonna ask you, you know, how you anticipate different digital ecosystems like Apple and Google and you met, you know, mentioned Amazon, they have their own like moats. At least they did. You're implying that, you know, the boundaries will not exist anymore with these AI devices. Do you think that will be the case? Or do you think these brands will figure out ways to isolate themselves and require consumers to only use them? Yeah. So um, so the walled garden theories around uh, data marketplaces and data uh, sort of practitioners, um, I would say if you have a situation like the, the R1, the large action model, um, and that's that's just one example. But if you have something where there is an abstraction layer of normal interfaces, and the, a machine can mimic your mouse movements and clicks, which we have, um, we've, we've been doing this for years. Actually, SEOs know this really well, right? Like, because there's there's fake clicks, there's all these things. If you have that layer, then you could see an abstraction level. I think we're first going to, I, those people will try that. But I think if Google and Amazon and Apple launch something that really lets you leverage the data you have with them, they're going to be able to really capture a massive portion of the market. And I, I think that's what everyone should expect, which is, the for, like, for example, um, my nine-year-old son talks to uh, his Amazon device. Uh, I won't say her name because she'll start talking to us. But if, if, if he talks to her all day, like Greek mythology, you know, how far is the moon from the, the sun, like all these things. Half the time he asks a question, she has to say, well, according to Google, do you think Amazon wants to say, according to Google? Absolutely not. They all want their own knowledge. They want their own objective, both branded and unbranded knowledge. And that's what they're building. The more they have that layer, the more they can use the data that you've already agreed to share with them, your prior purchases, your emails, your schedule, your calendar, all that stuff to really help you get things done. And so I think the internet was like this ideal of we could access knowledge. It's not. The internet is access to content. What this is doing is, is it's giving us access to knowledge, which gives, a, gives causal relationships between what I want to know and what I want to do, the how and the why. And I think that it won't be only theirs. And for certainly their business models, I think um, Google, from an advertising perspective, is really in a pinch. Um, but I could see Google coming to you and saying, listen, I power everything for you, your Gmail, your calendar, your this or that, pay me 20 bucks a month and I will make your life infinitely more and people will pay, right? Um, on the other side, the ad model is going to need to change. It's It can't just be ads. It's going to have to switch from ads to offers, uh, which is a whole different discussion. But But to me, I think some of these ecosystems are so natural, like Apple's commitment to privacy. I love it. But- like you said, they've got to get conversational AI working there. And as soon as they do, I think they're going to reap wonders because they're paid with the hardware purchase. So we're really going to see a, 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 a fundamental shakeup of the way the models work. But where it goes beyond that is there could also be where I have my own R2-D2. So look two years from now where I have a personal AI that talks to those AI or brand AI. And I say, hey, R2-D2, can you talk to Disney? I'm acting like he's right here, but could you talk to Disney and, and reach out and find out if we can take the bright line up there and stay for the weekend from where we live here in Boca? And it will do the entire dossier and Disney will have no idea who's asking that question. So the privacy will get abstracted one layer further. That is the natural distribution of these capabilities over time. That's a challenge. Like, it's funny. On the one hand, I want to ask you about privacy and your thoughts there, because that's really interesting. But I am curious about you're talking about the idea of content and not branded on branded and wall gardens. What are the implications of the ad revenue changing for Google? 
for content creators, publishers, and businesses? Like, yeah. I'd imagine you, you've thought about the implications of that. Yeah, um, I, I think there, there's a few things. Number one, the content will still be absolutely vital. But I, I think we're going to be living in this world of monologues and dialogues. To, to mm -hmm. some extent, we live in a world of monologues today. And what I mean by that is brands or uh, information services, news agencies, they're pushing out monologues. It's not a dialogue with the consumer. It's a monologue. Um, th the fallacy of the internet for the last 20 years, in my opinion, is it's sort of like they look at everything and go, you know what we need is more monologues because we got to show up in Google search, right? Centralized search ecosystems force the the infinite expansion of monologuing, right? Um, and I think of like evil monologues like in, in villains and movies, but that's that's what it's there for. It's, the, it's their time to tell you why they're doing what they're doing. Okay, that is going to start to part ways to where the actual user experience is a dialogue. It's literally where every digital website says, hey, how can I help you today? And I say, well, I'm looking for new shoes. And it goes, great, what are you into? Well, I'm into marathon, great. Like that dialogue in three back and forths, three smart back and forths, they will know more than what a year and a half of cookie tracking in, 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 incorrectly made them think they should show me on the homepage. That's just wrong. Because every person suffers a little bit from um, DID, dissociative identity disorder, which is I'm a different person on this podcast with you than I will be in an hour when my nine-year-old gets home, right? Mm -hmm. We change. At, at the context is not just the context of the discussion. The context is of the moment, right? And so that moment dialogue is infinitely better and infinitely more personal than all the crappy half personalization monologues we've been pushing out. And I think that's really the change for marketers. We really need to think about, you gotta still push out the, the, those monologues because you gotta show up, but you need to start preparing for using dialogue, not creepy tracking stuff. Focus on the dialogue, the honest conversation. And the more you do that, that will tell you what new monologues to push out. Because you'd be like, hey, I didn't know people wondered about that. Wow, let's talk about that over here. So we attract more of them. So it's a very simple process. It, it's not different than, look, the SEO community has been so bright about this for so long. They're looking at keywords. But ever since not provided, Google has basically said, I'm not going to share with you. I know that gives every SEO like the willies, like, ah, like get under your desk in the fetal position. Not provided was them saying, I'm not going to tell you this stuff anymore. And we need that long tail stuff because that's the next conversation to build a good monologue on to attract the next dialogue. So I think that's the process it has to go through. No, I mean, to that point, whether you're talking about like SG, however that rolls out or some of the AI tools, you know, there's not that attribution from the Google perspective. So, you know, SEOs that, you know, or cookies to your, to that point for marketers, there's this this fear, this frustration. I do want to tap into the privacy data element though, is based on what you're saying, it feels like if you want to participate in this, you need to give up your data. Yes, it might be abstracted, but you're going to be in the system. Is that just something we'll all just have to be okay with? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think we have been trying to get the world to wake up. So you probably saw the social dilemma and all these yeah. documentaries, right? And I think to some extent that did a really good job. But if that didn't scare you enough to dismantle your Facebook, your Instagram, and your, right? It didn't. Okay. People are like, yeah, I know my data privacy, my data privacy, Bye. but I want to see cat videos, right? Like it, it's not, that trade-off was not obvious enough. Um, and, and I think to some extent, the reason why that didn't work is when you have legislative bodies and you have courts and you're trying to explain Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism, to them, and why if the product is free, then the product is me. And this understanding of all of the depth of someone being able to say, we're not selling the data, we're selling an audience. It's totally different. It's not. And so the reality is, is that's too abstract. But I'm going to channel my brother here for everyone that doesn't know. My, my brother, James Ward, he's a data privacy attorney. He's also uh, uh, just an absolute brilliant guy. And he, he lives in Europe and he does European and American, uh, the intersection of data uh, strategy. And basically what he would say is AI is sort of like the oh my gosh moment for what data privacy was trying to do. And the reason why he says that is you're going to be able to ask your AI, hey, what data did you just share when I did that? And it's going to explain it right? It's, it's, it's going to open up that you could say, hey, I want to plan a weekend at Disney, but I don't want you to share any personal data. 
And the, the companies that try to block that, they're going to immediately bring down the wrath of the, reg the regulators. And, and here's why. Regulators, legislators, uh, courts, they think, as Jay would say, analogistically, which means most judges or most you know, legislators, they look at law and they say, oh, wait a second. You created someone that stands in front of your store and you didn't train them well and they ask inappropriate questions and they're kind of rude and they actually don't give the right information to a consumer. We've had those laws for 400 years. Welcome mm -hmm. to agency theory, right? Which is if they don't act as an agent, you're at fault as the company. You could, you could get away with this from a data privacy perspective as a big company using crazy technical terms in front of lawyers. You are not going to get away with one AI talking to another AI with a consumer in the middle and them saying, what did you just share to each other? If you don't transparently show what's going on, you're going to have a problem. So I think the wave of privacy really wasn't big enough to break shore, but I think AI carries it through. And that's, that's a very likely outcome. It will take time, right? But it will get there. But it's complicated. I mean, we saw a couple of weeks ago with, well, the the start of the OpenAI versus New York Times lawsuit and the fact that like these LLMs are already trained on existing like common crawl that like is out there and you yeah. can't, you can't, to your point, put the toothpaste back in the, in the toothpaste container. Like it is you, and there's po data poisoning issues. Like how does all this stay clean and above board? And it just seems like yeah. a mess. So um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a debate I was having with my brother. I, I got, it was fun. I got to spend the holidays with our families both <laughs> in great. Scotland together. And uh, this is kind of like a this is like a Thanksgiving dinner for us. So as as, as we're talking, I, I was asking him about that because Japan has gone on record as saying we are not going to have a problem with you training on any material. Japan has taken the stance of they look at it as it's no different than a young artist or a young writer learning by reading Hemingway and adopting portions of how they their style. Now, if you quote specifically, or you say, write this in the style of Dr. Seuss, then you're at fault and you should be in trouble for that. But that's not what's really happening. Now, Jay says the EU will not adopt that strategy. But now you have another lower tax haven problem, right? Because I can go and have a lower tax by training in, in potentially in Japan and deploying worldwide. There's just a ton of IP questions. And, and again, I'm way out of my depth here. I'm literally just quoting my brother. So maybe you should speak with him next. But but the next step of it is, is you, you, you have to look at if you're the New York Times and you put this information out there, or you're an SEO and you're writing and you're writing these content strategies, there's also a little bit of blame on all sides, right? Mm -hmm. So if we want to protect journalism, then we have to solve this problem. But if you're also an SEO or you're a journalist saying, I want my article to show up, well, you are okay freely sharing it to a centralized search ecosystem. And so what then happens is I, I guarantee by next summer, there will be a billion generated articles on summer gardening tips, okay? Mm -hmm. They're all going to be generated by GPT. And in a way, you're almost handing Google and OpenAI, you're handing them the legal basis to say, but you're just generating it anyway. So I'm going to generate it myself. We have to look at the precedent that we're setting, which is if you tell me that no journalist uses AI for any research, any use case, anything, then you could say it's fully human. I think you're going to have some shaky ground. Like they already showed those New York Times articles. I'm not picking on their, I really think they're doing the right thing of challenging it. But it's very clear that they're prompting, and it's almost prompt injection, it's almost a penetration attempt to get it to give them exactly what they want. And I, I understand that. They're like, no, it's in here, and we know it's in there. But I'm not sure that's the same thing as saying they owe you for every piece of content you ever created. Because that means every child that ever read the New York Times in college might owe you something too, and that's not going to work. Dude, uh, there's so many big problems that are going to come with this, but there's so many opportunities. I don't, I hate to end on like a, a you know, scary note because I, you and I, like, there's so much more that we could geek over. And, and, and obviously we have only a certain amount of time. So I'll probably have to have you back on at some point. But I do want to segue to the rapid fire rankings, which we're going to do a special version. Usually we do SEO version, but you, it's too much fun. Are you cool if we do like an AI version of the rapid fire rankings? Yeah, I, look, I have I have a ton of respect for um, how, how you run this with the rankables. This is a great idea, but I, maybe we should stick to data and AI uh, instead. 
Okay, well then we're gonna do it your way, and I'm excited because I I just love geeking out. I mean, I'm into this too. So let's put the music up, and we are gonna get going. First off, Mr. Christian Ward, top five changes to marketing. Go. Um, I think the first one is cookie deprivation. So that that's happening no matter what. Uh, I, we've all been waiting for it for like 27 years, it feels like. Uh, so cookie deprivation is number one. Number two, every marketer is going to have to make a really tough choice. With cookie deprivation, are you going to keep trying to get around the rules and still use some form of tracking or re-identification scheme? Or are you going to embrace zero-party data where the consumer dialogue is really how you run your personalization? I'm, I'm going to give you a hot tip. I would go with the second one, but sure, whatever you got to do. Um, SEO content and generation, the overhaul of SEO will probably be a major theme for marketing for the next several years. Um, there is an academic paper that I saw making the rounds on generative engine optimization. Everyone should read that, take it, print it, highlight it, get to understand what's happening there because generative engine, and by the way, we should get away from search engine optimization. It should be search experience optimization like because that. it's just it's it should be from the consumer's perspective, not from yours in terms of what tool this is. Remember why we do this. It's not for you, it's for the consumer. Um, and then uh, I think marketers are gonna move from monologues to dialogues. So instead of just pushing out content, they're gonna split evenly and use chat, search, reviews, and social to engage in more dialogue so they can learn the actual customer voice. Every brand says that we want the customer's voice, but they don't have the tools to do it. Now you do have the tools to do it. Um, and lastly, and this, this one's tough, I think CMOs are in for a really rough ride of rethinking about all of the metrics that they've grown so accustomed to, which is they've been able to see all these metrics and they have this belief system in ROIs that I would argue are probably not accurate. Um, we know that there's a lot of bleeding over from one, one element to another, but I think if they start to focus on the metrics coming from those dialogues, they're gonna be thrilled with the insights of what people are asking at scale instead of keywords and none of the long tail. So I think the metrics are gonna really change. In other words, um, you shouldn't be looking at impressions, right? And yeah. SEOs and everybody knows this, but you should also not just be looking at engagements, you should be looking at meaningful dialogue. It's a completely different thing and almost nobody does it today. Um, but those would be my five big changes, I think, for marketing. That's huge. Uh, so much to unpack there, but I feel like that that could be a whole podcast in itself. So interesting. Okay, what are your top five AI expectations? That's fun. Um, so uh, these these <laughs> so I'm more excited than accurate on any of these things. So take yes. all these with a grain of salt. Um, so the first one is I, I think using AI in our daily work is absolutely happening this year. Um, for those people that aren't using it, you definitely should start thinking about using these tools. But I mean, you're gonna be able to use it in your PowerPoint, your Excel, your Google Sheets, all of that very quickly. Um, Ethan Mollick has a great post on this of being careful about people just like, you send me an email and I just hit auto rip, I hit the, the button and the button writes it, rewrites it and sends it back and then you hit the button and we get to where we've had like 10 emails and have agreed to something that no humans actually looked at. We gotta be careful with that, but that's gonna happen. Um, the big one I, I'm really excited for, which I don't think has happened yet, but it, it can, it's starting to happen, is what I call prompt inversion. So everyone got into, oh, you gotta learn how to prompt, prompting's the future. I'm like, no, it's not, stop it. That's, that's adorable, it's not the truth. Prompting is going to invert. So right now, humans are prompting the machine, but in the next six months, the machine will prompt the human and that opens up AI. It's exactly what you're bringing up earlier, Garrett, which is some people don't know what to do with this. And I'm like, yeah, but if it can help you know how to use it, now you're talking and that's going to happen. Um, I think that um, you're gonna see AI, for number three, AI model convergence. Uh, now, there's gonna be a lot of uh, people upset about this one, but, but hear me out. Um, language asymptotes. So, so basically the understanding of English, which is a very difficult language, or like our idiomatic usage are, is appalling. Um, like when I say you and I are on the same page, or if I say a chili pepper, like AI is like, you mean like a cold pepper? Like, what do you mean? Like, it's very tough to understand. Um, so that's all gonna asymptote in the next nine months. Meaning from a language perspective, 
I think you'll see that almost all the models can understand language equally well. And that starts to get into the decline in the price of it. Where you'll see the real breakouts in the technology will be around multimodality. So can the AI see better than another? Can it hear better than another? Can it feel better than another? All those things, that's where I think this goes after that because language will asymptote very, very quickly. Um, uh, the next one, oh, I think conversational UIs just absolutely explode. I think they're gonna be everywhere. Um, I already have them as my lock screen for GPT and uh, my note-taking app, which is Reflect. They're amazing. You just, you're on a walk, you hit a button, you talk to it, it transcribes it. It's like those UIs are gonna proliferate. Um, and then I think further out, 24 months, you get into real personal R2-D2 AI. And again, if you're a marketer, that means you've got to stop worrying about showing up just in centralized search. You need to start understanding of what are people dialogues are happening and can you get some of that data because you're gonna lose touch with what's really important very quickly. I mean, that's why community matters so much. You see so many of these like community led marketing initiatives. Um, yes. Okay, so top five, this is fun, five, top five tools to try to learn. There's so many tools out there, dude. What are your top five? Yeah, it, I mean, there are a lot of tools, but like, so do you remember, <laughs> maybe it was like four months ago, uh, GPT went down for like nine hours. Yeah. Um, and I, I posted something funny and I got a lot of great responses, but I was like, it was like you could almost hear the billions of individual dollars from venture capitalists that were saved from not being invested. <laughs> like the number of dollars <laughs> whose lives were saved. And it's because a lot of these are just, you know, the the uh, uh, Scooby-Doo episode where they pull off the, the, the mask and it's just GPT. So look, I think the first one is they're still at the cutting edge. Everyone should get a chat GPT account. Um, look, you pay $20 for Disney, $40 for Prime, uh, $30 for Disney Hulu. You're talking about storytelling and escapism or you could pay twenty dollars and access in conversation the smartest being you've ever experienced and learn how to engage with it for your future of your health wealth and career i think it's time get it okay um the next one uh that i love is opus um so in, in sort of if you do videos or you do um keynote speeches or podcasts opus is this brilliant idea it's also the third tool uh swell where you can give it a video and it will actually analyze it and go, hey, this part was boring, but this part Garrett really nailed it. And it will actually clip <laughs> it. It'll clip it, it'll give you the transcript, and then you can go from there. It's actually, it's very helpful because you all are producing, especially if your brands and your clients, great content, but you're not scaling it well. And the AI is quite good at that. So that's um, Opus and Swell. Um, the fourth one, and I am absolutely in love with it, it's it's uh, the, the team that built, or a couple of the people that built People AI, which was a phenomenal data company. Um, it's it's called uh, Reflect. And I think it's like the Reflect app. You have to go online uh, on desktop first to get it, and then you can download the, and this thing, it's a knowledge graph, which obviously I work at Yext, we're all knowledge graphs. So it's a knowledge graph of all of my notes, but now it processes auditory. Uh, so I can actually just speak my notes and then it will give me my to-dos. It, it will connect the to-dos to the other elements in the graph. Um, so as, as you can tell, I, I think a lot in terms of academic theories and books and authors. And so it connects it all. So I can literally click on like Daniel Kahneman and see every time I've ever talked about him in any conversation, what else he's done, all the papers, because he's one of the most brilliant thinkers I've, I've ever had the joy of reading. And I'm kind of like, that's the type of thing you want to focus on. So uh, Reflect is amazing. Um, Anthropic, you should just try it as an alternative to GPT. And I'm going to throw in a shameless plug for Yext. Like everything we do at Yext has AI ingrained in it. We're improving knowledge graphs. We do reviews. We do content generation. We do all those things. We do it a little differently, which is, we're merging a knowledge graph with the large language model in a RAG construct, so a retrieval augmented generation. Anyone who knows I pull rank, this was probably one of my favorite posts by Mike, uh, which is he did the entire thing, and I'm laughing as I'm reading it. So I'm like, that is literally what we're doing. Um, but it's great to know. I, I think we all, there's many of us that see very similar, like history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. There's a lot of rhyming on that effort right now. But those would be the tools I would focus on. And that's so cool because you might go back. You guys have known each other for like over a decade at this point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And again, from a like, you know, he 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 is a he's a content mind, right? He's a creator uh, before all of it. 
but then he's technical. And so I love the overlap, but a lot of times the way he creatively explains, so he's almost like technical with application. So any of you who have not read that post, um, I'm sure Garrett can, can link to it, but it is, it is phenomenal. It's like cool Feynman, right? Like being able to explain to everyone where they actually are interested in it. And you do it as well. I think, you know, you're, you, it's very fun to listen to you speak about these ideas because you're so excited. Um, speaking of like, let's share some other great people. Who are the top five people to follow for AI? Um, so so my, the number one that I usually point people to is Ethan Mollick. Um, so he is the Wharton Professor of Entrepreneurship. Um, he's also an MIT uh, uh, grad or professor. Um, just absolutely brilliant, but he's, He's one of the most generous. He, he basically is posting. So he is reading and analyzing papers all day and, and writing academic and peer reviewed journals. But he, he just kind of really quickly will say, hey, uh, this just came out. Here's what it means. You should pay attention to it. Gotta follow Ethan. Um, the, the next one is, um, if you don't follow, it's called The Rundown, but it's Rowan Chung. Um, and he's awesome. And it's basically, he's like, he's better than every news agency way ahead of them on what's happening every single day. Um, and he's outstanding. So again, LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter, I'm more of a, a LinkedIn guy, but it, he's phenomenal. Um, the next is Paul Ratzer, you've mentioned uh, already. He runs the Marketing AI Institute, him along with Mike Caput, um, and as well as the whole team there, I think it's Kathy McCormick, like really, really bright. Um, they also throw an amazing conference, but they're like specifically marketing AI, which is really, really great. Um, and then there's two more, um, Ali Miller, has a phenomenal career and she posts, she's like my favorite for a, a, the application of AI. Mm -hmm. um, so she talks a lot about what does it mean for careers, jobs, people. It's a lot of the, it's, it's, it's like a second order thinking and I find it really, really refreshing. Um, and then last is uh, probably a lot of people know Cassie Kozikoff. Um, she is, uh, was the head of decision science at Google. She's now on her own. It's really freed her up a lot. Um, but uh, like the, when you look at, that AI is really just the, the, it's the promise of the internet finally coming true, which is it's actually decision assistance versus content access. Like one was the card catalog at the library. The other is the smartest PhD research assistant you've ever known. That's a huge change. And she frames it and does phenomenal posts and lectures on it. Um, but I think, I think all five of them are, are outstanding. So many great resources, man. Like, you know, as, as ChatGPT would say, game changer. No, but yeah, finally, yes. I got to ask you, what is your generative AI hot take? Uh, well, it, define for me hot take. Like, what, 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 like, like worst, worst point of view or, or best? Because a lot of what people are, like, What uh, do yeah. you think that the mainstream is not talking about? Even in your circles, what is your contrarian perspective? Contrarian wise for generative AI, um, I would say that I think that this is so much more impactful than people understand. There's, there's something called, uh, Amara's law. Um, and it, it was, it, it was coined, um, uh, it, it's years ago, but Roy Amara wrote that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, um, but underestimate the effect in the long run. Um, I think that's this, I, I think that people are very much misunderstanding. Uh, because every time I hear someone saying, oh, are you adopting this? I'm like, you're, you're, you're really thinking about this wrong. Um, this is such a paradigm. And that's, again, hype cycle. People can talk about it. You know, it's kind of funny is the hype cycle where it's like hype and then it drops. Do you know that's the same curve as the Dunning-Kruger curve? Which is the more people learn about something, they're like, oh, I totally get this. But actually, as you learn more, you go, oh, my God, I don't understand this at all. And then you come out at the end. That's this. And if you're not applying that to everything you're doing, my hot take is you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you need to see that this literally touches every avenue of your life, personally and professionally. And I, I think that's, it's bigger than gen AI. I know we say gen AI, but what I'm talking about is the, the unlock that conversational AI brings to all other things. It goes back to that technology acceptance model. If the cognitive burden of learning your software goes to zero, then I'm gonna use it 100% potentially of its use case. Do you know that McKenzie and others say people only use 25 to 30% of every software package they buy? That's, are you kidding me? So what do they do? They buy more, we call it a MarTech stack, implying like a stack of crap on your desk that's gonna tip over because you're not using all those tools. So I think Gen AI, that's the beauty. It's not it, it's what it unlocks with no cognitive burden. That's, that's probably my biggest take.
uh, inspiring, man. It's, it's like I want to go and just like have a conversation, use the five minute technique, do the you know, do some dictation and, and produce all this with ChatGPT, play with you know, runway, create video, all that fun stuff. Thank you so much for joining me. If, if someone wants to continue this conversation with you online or just reach out and connect, where's the best place to find you? Uh, so I'm, I'm at LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody about this stuff. Obviously I enjoy it. I've been waiting for this for a good bit. Um, I've been in AI machine learning, but I'm really in data for a long time. I, I think the reality is, is none of us are going to build the next AI. It's far more likely to come from open AI, Apple. If I would say to anybody, like you want to connect on this concept, which is your AI strategy is really just your data strategy. Uh, I'd love to talk about that. So uh, LinkedIn on my ward, christianj.com, um, or they can just reach out at christian at yex.com with email. Awesome, Christian. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been an awesome conversation. Absolutely, Garrett. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll definitely look forward to the next time. Excellent. My name is Garrett Sussman of iPull Rank. We'll catch you later for another Rankable Expo episode. See you then.